every medalist, every record holder, every athlete that you see competing in the Olympics must go through a system that most people never see. This system is designed to catch cheating athletes who take performance enhancing drugs to gain an advantage over their competition. Though as we will soon learn, no system is perfect. Today, we will be going over the numerous methods that anti-doping authorities use in the fight against drugs in sport. And I will also be revealing the controversies surrounding the system that not enough people are talking about. Our first player is an organization called WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, which is the central organization for drug testing worldwide. Every year they publish a big list of all substances that are banned from elite sport and rely on national or independent doping agencies such as USADA, UCAD or the ITA to enforce testing of these substances. While they don't actually do much of the testing themselves, they monitor how the rules are enforced and will penalize agencies if they are not compliant. Think of it like a headmaster administering school rules whilst the teachers enforce them. But how does WADA decide which drug should be banned and which shouldn't be? Well they look at the substances and see if they match at least two of the following three criteria. One, it enhances sporting performance, two, it has the potential to cause harm to the athlete, and three, it goes against the spirit of the sport. That last one's a little fuzzy and we'll get into it in a moment. For instance, Nandrolone is a common PED used for muscle recovery and strength development. It can also cause hives, liver issues, bone pain, and loads of other fun stuff. Since it fulfills two of the criteria, it is banned by WADA, but that does not stop it from being one of the most commonly used PEDs around. But back to that third rule, how exactly does WADA define the spirit of the sport? Well, they judge this based on several values as listed here. How exactly these substances go against these principles is vague, but for our purposes, see it as anything that goes against the idea of being a positive ambassador for the sport or undermining the fairness principle of anti-doping. A classic example is banning marijuana use around competition dates, something that 2023 100-meter world champion Shikari Richardson found out the hard way. She received a one-month suspension for taking marijuana when she tested positive for THC after the USA Olympic trials, and she said this was a coping mechanism after learning her biological mother had passed away. Although marijuana is not seen to meaningfully enhance performance in any way, it does have negative health effects and is seen as unprofessional, and therefore against the spirit of the sport. Richardson accepted the ban and was unable to compete in the Tokyo Olympics as a result of the timing, despite being a medal hopeful for USA. But how exactly was she caught? Well, there are two times an athlete is tested throughout the year in competition and out of competition. As you'd expect, in competition tests take a sample of the athlete in the days leading up to, during, and a few days after big events like the Olympics to ensure they are not on any substances during the competition. They are normally in the form of blood or urine samples as the PEDs athletes take can leave behind evidence of their use in their bodies, which anti-doping tests can detect. Athletes are often tested right after a race, which can be awkward if it's a urine test. Imagine you have just done a marathon in the blazing heat at a pace faster than most people can run 100 meters. It's safe to say you might be a little bit de hydrated. But if an athlete is called for a urine test after a race, they must be supervised at all times and stay within the designated area until they have given a sample to avoid any tampering. But there are regular cases where athletes need to wait hours after a race to pee so they can give a valid urine sample to be tested. But although the majority of people are caught with in-competition tests, out-of-competition tests are arguably more important, as most athletes who dope are usually not injecting themselves in the Olympic Village, at least if they know what they're doing. Instead, they take drugs during training throughout the year and cycle off it come competition day to avoid being flagged by by the event's testing window. But to make sure athletes can't do the same thing before out of competition tests, doping staff need to know the athlete's location to show up and announce for a drugs test. And this is where the real cat and mouse game begins. They do this through WADA's whereabouts system, which has been the source of a lot of controversy among elite athletes. Every three months, the athletes need to log their exact location down to the address and postcode in a one hour time slot where they are available for testing between 5 a.m. and 11 p.m. And this is done on WADA's Adam system. They also need to detail the exact location of where they stay overnight, train, go to school, or work, as well as their competition schedule over the next few months. This means a tester will know exactly where they are during the day and can surprise them with an on-the-spot test. Now, athletes must submit to testing at any point in the day, be it at 3 p.m. or 3 a.m., but the one-hour time slot just gives a single point in the day where the tester can guarantee where the athlete is instead of hoping they are at home when they come knocking. If an athlete's planned location changes, they must update the system as soon as possible or they risk being charged for missing a test or a filing failure. If they rack up three of these within a 12-month period, the athlete can be subject to a two-year ban, unless they can provide legitimate reasons for their absence. They could also prove that they were in their stated location, but the tester did not go to sufficient lengths to try and find them. Now this all may sound very intrusive and complicated, and that's because it is. It's exactly why many athletes, such as Olympic 200 meter gold medalist Gabby Thomas, have been very vocal criticizing the system. Thomas recently came under controversy after posting on her Instagram that anyone who has been banned or whose coach was previously banned in their career should be barred from competing in the sport for life. This was interpreted as a thinly veiled criticism of rival sprinter Melissa Jefferson Wooden, who was having a stellar 2025 season, beating Thomas multiple times before she posted this. 
Jefferson Wooden's coach, Dennis Mitchell, has been involved with doping controversy in the past. But as fans have highlighted, Thomas was embroiled in her own controversy, where she was almost banned for missing three doping tests herself in her early career. The ban was successfully appealed when the AIU ruled that Thomas was actually in her stated location for one of the tests, and that the agent had simply failed to find her. As for the other tests, the Olympic champ said that she was early in her career and did not understand the severity of anti-doping measures and missing tests at the time. She says the whereabouts system is poorly explained to athletes, especially given its complexity and importance, instead advocating for a live location system. This would allow WADA to track athletes constantly through their phones instead of the bureaucracy of a one hour a day system. I have my own thoughts about this whole situation and Gabby Thomas's own virtue signaling on the topic, but I should note she has never missed a test since this debacle. On this note though, I think that when we're talking about the invasiveness and complexity of this system, we need to remember that we're dealing with elite athletes here. These guys are professionals, their focus is on training only, and it is their job to make sure they comply with anti-doping measures. An accountant may complain that the tax system is complex and has excessive bureaucracy, but it's their job to figure that out and navigate the system regardless. And most athletes do manage it, even if it's not exactly easy. Here is the kicker about all of this though. Some experts believe that most athletes are severely under-tested out of competition. They have suggested that athletes need to be tested anywhere from 16 to 50 times a year for the system to be truly effective. This is because most PEDs can be out of your body in a matter of hours, especially when taken in smaller quantities or with drugs designed to hide evidence of their use. So if there are only a handful of days in the year when you could test positive, testing needs to be super frequent to ensure you will be tested on those few days. So does international anti-doping meet this standard? In the 10 months prior to the Olympics, the Athletics Integrity Unit reported an average of 3.8 out of competition tests for athletes competing in the Olympics. World Aquatics reported 3.4 times for swimming. In weightlifting it's even worse, with only 1.33 out of competition tests per athlete. Compared to the figure of at least 16, this is pretty far off. It's not helped by the lack of funding most of these testing agencies have. It is not cheap to organize and pay for these tests, and as a result, the number of them completed tends to suffer. Of course, the distribution of tests varies based on the athlete. More successful athletes are likely to be tested more, while some low-level athletes might not even be tested at all out of competition. There is also a lot of politics on the rate of testing between different nations. For instance, Chinese swimmers who have been shrouded in doping controversy received an average of 20 out of competition tests compared to most other countries only receiving four to six. And these politics are a difficult issue which I will talk about more at the end of the video. But now we have covered the standard in competition and out of competition tests, there is one final method that is a little more advanced than the other two, and that is the athlete biological passport. This is a document of the regular blood markers in each athlete that is recorded through the results of samples taken in doping tests. The idea is that the testers have a log of the expected parameters of an athlete's blood markers on an individual basis, as natural levels can vary person to person, especially when you're dealing with elite athletes. If an athlete passes all their doping tests but suddenly shows elevated or lower blood markers compared to their history, WADA's system automatically flags it and testers can investigate further. For instance, EPO is a super common PED used in endurance athletes as it increases red blood cell count, allowing them to have more oxygen in their blood which increases endurance. It is very popular as it is difficult to detect in doping tests. On top of this, it really works. It's the stuff Lance Armstrong was caught on and he described it loosely as a 10 percenter which is monumental in the endurance world. Whilst it's difficult to detect directly, Directly, EPO does raise an athlete's hematocrit level significantly, which might not be suspicious in isolation, but looks adverse compared to an athlete's history in the biological passport. It's also a nice way to detect if an athlete is cycling off PEDs as their levels may drop unexpectedly. This system is by no means foolproof as it relies on averages and there are methods and drugs out there that can be used to inhibit the elevation of certain blood markers. If the athlete is not tested very often, which we've established there aren't, the ABP will not be running on much data and can just miss a complete doping cycle. So far we have covered how athletes are tested, but what exactly happens happens if they are found to be positive. Because of the severity of doping, both in the direct sanctions that can be given, but also the reputational damage an athlete may receive, doping agencies can't just go guns blazing with a ban if an athlete tests positive for a substance. There is a whole official process surrounding this with a lot of technical language, so let's break it down step by step. First, the anti-doping organization will flag up an ADRV, anti-doping rule violation. This could be an analytical ADRV, where the athlete has an AAF, adverse analytical finding, in their testing or doping passport. Essentially, they have directly or indirectly tested positive for PED use. It could also be a non-analytical ADRV, which could be anything from dodging tests, tampering with samples, possessing PEDs, 
or attempting to do any of these things in the first place. From here, the process and relevant authorities varies from sport to sport, but it normally looks something like this. Once the ADRV is flagged, the athlete is notified of the violation and is usually provisionally suspended from competition whilst the disciplinary process is happening. They normally get a chance to formulate a response and have a private trial in front of the relevant authority in their sport. Maybe they had an emergency change of plan and were not in the location they specified for the whereabouts form. Maybe they unknowingly took a tainted supplement which caused them to inadvertently have heightened levels of a banned substance in their body. Maybe the finding itself is false and was not done at a WADA accredited laboratory. In some sports, the trial is done with a panel of the Global Federation. So that's the IWF for weightlifting or the UCI for cycling. With combat sports like MMA and boxing, it's usually done through independent agencies like USADA. Some sports like athletics and swimming have their own independent organizations to adjudicate cases in the AIU and AQIU. Regardless, the athlete goes through the trial, is given their decision and has the right to appeal if they are found guilty. If they lose the appeal, then they are sanctioned, normally in the form of a two to four year ban from group training and competition. In the case of multiple, more severe or repeat rule violations, the sanction can be longer, with athletes receiving eight to 12 year bans. But whilst a ban can massively impact an athlete's career, it's arguably not the worst punishment that they receive. Because a two year ban from competition, while significant, is still easy enough to withstand in a long career. In fact, many people, myself included, advocate for lifetime bans in the case of a direct positive test. It seems pretty weird that someone can violate the rules and trust of fans and the authorities, then come back with a clean slate a couple years later like nothing happened. How are we supposed to know they've actually changed? How are we supposed to trust any of their results in the future? And this brings me on to the most damaging aspect of this process, which is the reaction. Because once the media gets a hold of this info, the athlete's reputation is in the mud. It's career destroying for many people, and understandably so. Fans do not like investing their emotions and energy into someone that turns out to be a liar and a cheat. So even if athletes do return to competition, sometimes looking better than ever, they are widely hated by the sporting community. So far, I have only scratched the surface on the controversies and international politics surrounding these issues. There are many countries like Kenya who have been specifically embroiled in national doping scandals that have exposed systemic issues with the system. If you want to find out why many people want to ban Kenya from international sporting competition and the key nuance they're overlooking, then click on this video here. And if you have any further questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Happy training.